Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us today. We do have a slight change this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are at. Um, we are delighted to have April Foreman today filling in for Dr. Thompson. April is a licensed psychologist serving veterans as suicide prevention coordinator for Southeast Louisiana Veterans Healthcare System. She also serves as suicide prevention lead for Veterans Integrated Service Network 16, a region of Veterans Affairs. She is passionate about helping people with severe and sometimes lethal emotional pain. She is known for her work at the intersection of technology, social media, and mental health with nationally recognized implementations of innovations in the use of technology and mood tracking. She is also a founder and moderator of the first sponsored regular mental health chat on Twitter, the weekly suicide prevention, excuse me, prevention social media chat, hashtag SPSM, sponsored by the American Association of Suicidology. In the two years, this chat has become one of the largest and most active mental health centered social media communities on Twitter. She is currently the social media chair for AAS, her dream is to use her unique skills and vision to build a mental health system effectively and elegantly designed to serve the people who need it. April today will be reviewing with us the methods to re reach veterans and their families, connect those who are facing challenges with care, and reduce the stigma of seeking support for crises such as suicide. She will also include an overview of VA's integrated approach to suicide prevention which will outline contact-based approaches to mental health outreach and education and key elements of the VA suicide prevention program, including local suicide prevention coordinators, the Veterans Crisis Line, and the Make the, Cha Make the Connection campaign. Welcome, April. We're really happy to have you today. I am really, really thrilled to be here. I want to um, sort of shout out to everybody who's in the audience. Um, I know that you guys have a lot of things that you could be doing right now. I uh, hope we are at least getting some lunch, but you've chosen to tune in uh, with us today. And I'm really excited to be here. Dr. Thompson sends her regrets. Um, she has some important national leadership duties to take care of. And so she made sure to send me, uh, just because I really do enjoy these kinds of virtual presentations. Um, they're very important to me. I want to start by talking a little bit about sort of what drives me to do this work. I haven't always worked for VA. Um, I started my work in rural Kansas. I was the only psychologist uh, serving uh, patients in four of the sickest and poorest counties in rural Kansas. And I became very, very interested in this line of work. Um, I quit my um, academic career to do this clinical work. And I started to realize that there are people out there with extreme emotional pain and that getting access to really quality care, not just mental health care, but integrated care, it's a really huge challenge, uh, and um, and I and I started doing a lot of the activities that I did just in order to better solve some of the system challenges related uh, to recovering and going from a place of having uh, lethal emotional pain, possibly death by suicide, one of the worst outcomes of a mental health crisis, to actually recovering. I actually went to work for VA as a suicide prevention coordinator a little over four years ago. And I chose to move to VA uh, in, in when I was interviewing actually several kinds of places because I found out that we provide really, really good quality care, really good integrated care, and I've come to VA and, and uh, in comparison with what I was doing in the private sector, uh, everything that I'm about ready to talk to you guys about who are in the audience listening, this is really the kind of care that we provide. I provide this care. And it really is good. And I want to make sure you guys know about it and that you have time to ask some questions. I'm also really um, honored. I've uh, been detailed to the National Suicide Prevention Office. Uh, so I really am aware of how the VA really looks at in providing integrated care to reduce suicide risk. At the national level, I work as a suicide prevention lead at the regional level. And I also am stationed in Baton Rouge and you know, do care with actual patients who are at high risk of suicide locally. And, I, and I'm very excited to talk with you about that. Uh, what you're seeing on this first screen is part of our new campaign uh, about making a difference. And uh, what, one of the things that VA does a really good job of 
and I know that uh, the International Bipolar Foundation also does a good job of, is using media to help connect uh, community members with resources. We know that people, uh, we need to reach people where they are. And so the VA really, um, they work with Rheingold Media who produce these wonderful things that are the kinds of things that you might share. So as you're looking at all these resources, I'm going to tell you where you can find some of this content. So please do feel free to share it on your Facebook pages. Uh, share it on Twitter, uh, pass it around if you have, if you have, um, if your agencies or organizations have newsletters, please do share this. Uh, this stuff really works and I'm going to explain how it all sort of integrates in with all of, all of the care that VA provides to veterans at high risk of suicide. So what you're seeing here is part of our campaign to encourage people to, uh, connect with veterans. We know that, uh, if somebody's at risk for suicide and they're getting health care, that most of the time they're not in my clinic. Most of the time they're in their communities and that the people, when we have seen healthcare systems reduce risk of suicide and, more, and suicide mortality, it's really because we in, involve or engage their family, their friends, and their support networks and care. And so we encourage community members to, uh, to connect with veterans. We have, um, the veteran community is really special. I really love working with them. Because they are so connected to each other, and veterans will often look out for their buddy. I, I can't tell you, it's very different from civilian care, how often I get calls in my office from one veteran in the community who's calling me about his friend that he saw that didn't show up to a meeting or that's not doing well on Facebook. Veterans look out for each other. And so this is one small act that makes a difference, really encouraging peers to look out for each other. Uh, shift now. We also uh, know the importance of family. Uh, here's another uh, piece of our uh, public service announcements. One question can open the door to support. Uh, we have a lot of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans who are returning. Many of them are younger. Uh, and as a result, they often are still uh, really reliant on parents as part of their support network. And that's sort of a change from when we were really caring for Vietnam era veterans. Um, largely, you know, as being our primary patient base. Uh, now we are, state, we have younger patients and we really want to reach out to the mothers and fathers. So I often, uh, which is sort of a change in VA trends, I often get contact from mothers and fathers about their adult veteran child who they really need to figure out how to get into care. And this is really uh, another PSA that we use to encourage family members to ask questions. And to let, to really educate family members that they can call us when they're worried. We may not be able to give them information about their veterans clinical care, but family members can always call the veterans crisis line. It's 1-800-273-8255. Many of you will recognize that that is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And if you press one, you go to our call center in Canandaigua, New York, and you can consult. And all, and I'll explain sort of how that all works. There's a, beautiful process that uh, works I, I take part in every day. And so family members can ask about if, if a veteran's in crisis, they can call the local VA. And whether their uh, veteran is enrolled in VA or not, they can call the veteran's crisis line and they can get to someone like me locally eventually who can help consult and figure out what to do to help care for the person that they love. We have another one. This is, uh, you know, wonderful. We have a lot of spouses uh, who are worried. Um, the, our large, the large majority of our patient population, we'll see another slide on this, are males. Uh, and many of them are heterosexual males with uh, women, whether they're wives or girlfriends, who are their primary means of support. Uh, so we do a lot to really remember to reach out to that particular population. There are a lot of times when, um, because I'm serving, uh, a primarily male mental health demographic, and that's unusual. We know that women are way, way more likely to be engaged in mental health than men, but in the VA, that's a little different. And so it is often their partner, their spouse, or their girlfriend who will call and express concern and often will notice or seek help or encourage their veteran to seek help. So, of course, once again, here's a PSA where we reach out to, uh, to engage them in the veteran's care. And so here's another one. Again, we really work on, because of how social media works, we can do media campaigns that target a multitude of demographics so that people can see um, someone who looks like them, who looks like their support network, and who will, uh, who will contact us. 
uh, veterans today, uh, when we look at the kinds of veterans that we're serving, uh, we're serving roughly about 22 million veterans, uh, and the majority of which, about 20 uh, million of which are male, about 2 uh, million of which are female. Uh, and we're serving more women than ever before. I know that I get asked a lot about what we're doing for women veterans, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we just look at, down at some of the demographic data about how many of them are white, black, Hispanic, Asian, American Indian, uh, Alaska Native, and then of course we have Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. And if you look at the demographic, it's, it's not so different from what you would see in terms of the national demographic ratios. Slightly different, but pretty similar. And then we look at a sort of a breakdown by age. Um, you see, if you can see our Vietnam era veterans are still the largest uh, demographic that we serve, where a third of our patients, uh, a third of our service era patients are from the Vietnam era. But then we see Gulf War veterans and uh, post war, um, post September 11th veterans, that's our Iraq Afghanistan population. And in VA, we have acronyms, we call them our OES, OIS veterans for Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, that kind of thing. And then, of course, we have veterans that we that have significant amount of military service and that served during peacetime. That's a quarter of our veterans. And we still have World War II veterans that we're serving, uh, which, let me tell you, is a, um, most most folks who work in VA clinics will tell you total delight. And of course, we also serve veterans who served uh, during Korea, and and that's sort of about the ratio that we see them. Um, there is, we have a real serious population health issue. So we know in the United States and across the world, suicide is a leading cause of death. For Americans in general, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death. We know folks who are diagnosed with bipolar disorders, because I know what this is, the IBPS. Uh, we know that they are at a much elevated risk to die by suicide. Um, and we know that veterans are also particularly high risk population as well. So we know that for uh, veterans, the odds of um, the risk to dying by suicide is often much greater than the general population. And that's true for both our male and our female veterans. And we're looking at this graph. What you'll notice as you're looking at male veterans is that it used to be that for male veterans, the, their risk was much elevated um, over, over the general population. And it is, by the way, for our younger veterans. But what we're starting to see and we'll talk about that more in some other statistics, is that we're starting to see the rates of risk among the general population rise while the rates of risk for our veterans stays roughly the same. We are noticing some increase in risk in our younger veterans. I'll talk about that later. We also notice that uh, our risk of uh, suicide for our female veterans is higher than in the general population. Interestingly enough, one of the things that we notice is that female veterans are more likely to die by suicide using a firearm. And that's why we think that those mortality rates are higher. Uh, women veterans are, just like our male veterans, are trained and familiar and comfortable with the use of firearms. And because firearms are so lethal, um, we have to pay more attention to training women about gun safety who are veterans. Uh, and, and sort of, then you might, then you might think about if you are worried about managing suicide risk in the general population. Uh, this is pretty cool. And I'm going to talk about why this is. But, but one of the things that our research is showing us is that uh, veterans who are enrolled in care with VA are less likely to die by suicide than veterans who are not enrolled in care with VA. Uh, this is uh, good evidence. We have really good evidence that VA's uh, approach to suicide prevention is improving population health for veterans, especially population mental health. If you look at the blue bar, that is the suicide rate for 1999, uh, which is pretty hard to measure for a whole lots of reasons. Most states and most places in the country do not count their suicide rates. And I know that that's something that when I started doing this work was sort of surprising to me. Uh, and so counting, counting your regional or state suicide rate is really challenging to do. And then counting the rate of veterans who die by suicide is really challenging to do. And VA is the largest healthcare system in the world, and they were very, very diligent about collecting this data. And I won't bore you with the details, but we were very, very hard to get this information. When we started uh, really doing um, Suicide prevention initiatives with the intensity we're doing it now, it was about, I want to say, 2006, 2007, when they really started getting the ball rolling. 
up to 2010, you'll notice that we've really had an impact on veteran health. Uh, we were starting to notice um, back in the 1990s that suicide rates for veterans were rising. And by the way, we're also noticing suicide rates are rising for the general population. Uh, but then as we've, as we've sort of gone forward, what we've noticed is that uh, suicide rates, you're sort of looking at general populations in the U.S. and at the 23 states that we can measure. Uh, and then when we're looking at suicide rates for veterans, uh, that next sort of set of bars, that third one, is for veterans enrolled in veterans health care. What we notice is that uh, we've actually dropped the suicide mortality rate for veterans enrolled in health care from 1999 to 2010. For veterans not enrolled in VA health care, in fact, the suicide rate has risen. It's really important uh, for you to remember, and this is, this, will, uh, this is a really good commentary to make among your, um, among your networks. When we hear that statistic of 22 veterans dying by suicide every day, uh, based on the good evidence that has been collected, what we believe is that about 17 of those 22 veterans who die by suicide every day never make it to VHA care. And so the large majority of veterans at risk of suicide and who are going to die by suicide are, are veterans that we need to reach through community outreach. And this is why um, our VA puts such emphasis on outreach. And, and that's something I do a lot of, like, well, like I'm doing today. And, and we, we just educate community members because the only way to reduce veteran suicide in any meaningful way is to involve the community. Uh, for our male veterans, uh, VA users, uh, um, we've had a huge number of increased enrollment. So because of the reduction in force, uh, because we've gone to more, we have a lot more patients than we used to have in the VA system, and we're really seeing those rises right now. But even though we've got more patients, our overall suicide rates have actually remained relatively stable. So while we might notice an overall increase of veteran death, like that raw number, what we have to keep in mind is that we just have more male veterans. But our actual suicide rate within veterans that we treat in VA, we've actually kept stable. This is really important because the suicide rates for male veterans who are not getting VA care and the suicide rates for the general population have actually risen over the years. And what we know, uh, what we know is that the VA has been able to really keep uh, mortality rates stable when we've seen them rise in other populations. We're doing something that we know we have good clinical evidence for. We also happen to know that we're seeing um, some increase in mortality rates specifically among our younger veterans. Actually, most of our suicide mortalities are in veterans older than 50, but we're seeing a trend of our younger veterans having increased suicide risk, and we're working hard uh, using our best, most current data to, to devise plans for engaging their support networks and getting them care. And you can see, you can see that the blue uh, bars on this particular slide show that uh, the, the blue is sort of all veterans aged 18 to 29. And then, of course, we have it broken down uh, 18 to 24 and 25 to 29. And we see that as veterans age, their suicide rates are largely stabilizing as we go into the middle years. But for our young ones, we're seeing an increase. We uh, think that may be due to some, well, there are, I, I won't go into that, but there are some, um, there, we think there are some sort of environmental stressors related to that that we're working on uh, addressing through population health measures. Um, rates have also increased among female VA users as this population grows. We've seen a small but noticeable increase in, in female veterans who die by suicide. Uh, one of the questions that I often get asked locally and on a national level by our community members is, what are we doing for women? And, one, and I literally just sat in a regional meeting today where we were planning to, where we were planning a, a, a VA-wide, you know, a regional, uh, we're making regional recommendations for addressing the unique needs of female veterans. For example, we know that female veterans, in comparison with women in the general population, are more likely to die by suicide using a firearm. So uh, because we have clinics that we have a women's health program, what we're going to be doing is doing more education uh, related to particular risk, you know, uh, particular risk factor screenings for women who are veterans, and also doing a lot more training around 
uh, firearm safety and women's health that hasn't, you know, that hasn't historically been a population health focus anywhere. Uh, but because this is a unique risk factor for women veterans, that's something that we're going to be increasing training on. Uh, the VA has an integrated approach to suicide prevention, and we use a lot of different tools to get this done. And I want you to know, I participate in all these things on a nearly daily basis. This is uh, really a fabulous healthcare system to be working for. Uh, we use awareness and outreach. You're seeing me do that today. What you should know is that people who do my job, suicide prevention coordinators, do, are, are mandated to do five outreach events a month. So you imagine that each one of us, and there are hundreds of us, are doing, you know, 60 outreach events or more a year. Uh, we, I do things at the local level, so I'm, I'm meeting uh, with local uh, community emergency room, you know, providers, with law enforcement, with local counselors, therapists, with people responsible for population health in, in the state of Louisiana or at the vision level. We also, I, you know, I also do a lot of work in my private, you know, in my private life. We believe outreach is really important. The only way to get to those 17 out of the 22 veterans who die by suicide is simply to start talking directly to the community that takes care of them and to their support networks. Uh, this is really, really similar to what IVPF does. They, you guys do just so much awareness using media and outreach because the issue is that we need suicide safer communities. We just do. We, we need communities who are better trained in, more aware of mental health and suicide risk and are better trained in mental health first aid. So we do that. We also are really working on uh, access models for mental health care. If you call the Veterans Crisis Line in a crisis, they're going to get you someplace safe, either help you stabilize yourself where you are, and they're going to offer you a consult to someone called a suicide prevention coordinator. And I'm going to make sure you get seen uh, immediately. And there are lots of ways for me to do that, either in an ER or as a walk-in at a regular outpatient clinic. And, and we're able to and help any veteran immediately, even if they're not enrolled in VA. I think we're the only healthcare system that really is empowered to provide that kind of responsive care. I will tell you, as a provider who gets to help veterans get to that, I see veterans in crisis, and I also get, if, you know, if you're not right next to me, I cover a third of the state, I get you somewhere immediately, that the, the satisfaction uh, you know, as a psychologist doing that job and the reduction in stress that I don't have to, you know, I see you're in immediate crisis, but first I've got to ask if you're insured and what you can afford to pay for and all those things. I, I really don't, I'm really not in that position it's because I'm working for VA. That is a great relief. So even veterans who are not eligible or veterans who are not enrolled, I can get someone to care. Uh, we really take this seriously. We do an, something called enhanced care delivery. What that means is that uh, the VA has a system in place across the whole healthcare system for screening veterans for risk of suicide, both, you know, in primary care, they get screened at least yearly and as clinically needed, and in all mental health situations, and we identify people who are elevated risk for suicide. So if somebody, uh, you know, had a change of medication and it's not going well, or their symptoms have become more severe, if someone's recently attempted suicide, we have a way of uh, putting an alert in their record that they are at elevated risk. And this alert uh, puts special requirements on their healthcare system to respond to them in an enhanced way. So they are given um, extra attention and case management. We give them high frequency appointments. If they don't show for appointments, we have extra, um, we have extra measures in place to make sure to reach out to them and contact them. Uh, we're, you know, we have each uh, we have SPCs who do my job, who have teams, and we, we have a very small caseload of high-risk veterans, and we track their care really closely and go the extra mile for them. Their doctor, you know, and that means, like, if someone was at high risk for suicide, for example, and they presented in, you know, in pain at the primary care clinic, they're going to be treated with more sensitivity to the, their level of risk and the complexity of their case. So we're going we're gonna to realize that any stressors or strains or impacts on their health might increase their risk for dying by suicide, and we're going to really be attentive. Uh, I have to tell you, I really think this kind of care works. I know that there ha are some healthcare systems like the Henry Ford system or um, Bernal Little system in uh, upstate New York that are really able to do this at their clinics. The VA is able to do this on a large national scale, and, and that's just amazing. Uh, we're given a lot of, um, we're given a lot of resources, and the, 
the VA healthcare system, the leadership really insists on this quality of care, and, and I get to watch that happen every day. We do a lot of training and collaboration about suicide risk. One of the things that you should know, uh, and, and I think that surprises most people, is that uh, globally there isn't really a requirement for mental health, licensed mental health professionals to learn suicide risk assessment and intervention. And the research is really clear that in the general population, 90% of mental health providers don't get basic training, wouldn't pass a basic competency exam on assessing for suicide risk or intervening in an evidence-based way. This is really, I mean, when you consider that, this is really like um, cardiologists um, not knowing CPR. It's sort of surprising, but in fact, it's been well understood in the research field in suicidology for many years. And the way that the VA chose to address this is that it requires suicide prevention training for all staff. So all staff at VA get suicide prevention training uh, upon entering employment. That's just like they all get CPR training. They get suicide prevention training. And then clinicians also get additional training on how to do suicide risk assessments. And then we get additional training on things like safety planning. And we have really high expectations, higher than almost any other healthcare system. Uh, to provide a certain uh, a certain quality, a gold standard quality of safety planning and follow up with people that we identify as at risk. And the suicide prevention coordinators really ensure this training is provided. And we really um, and we review cases to really make sure that that our individual providers are are sticking to that standard of care. And I think that's why we're able to on this really big level hold down those suicide rates when we've been seeing them rise for people outside of our system. And then finally, and this is super cool as well, I'm pretty into it, we have, uh, we have research um, centers all over our VA, it's really integrated care, and, and in Colorado, there, and we call them MIRIC, it's just sort of VA speak for a research uh, organization that are centers of excellence. And in, Rocky, in the Rocky Mountain Myrick, they are a suicide prevention research center of excellence, and we have some of the best researchers in suicide prevention and in best practices, sort of study what best practices are and then study ways to implement them effectively and that research then provides recommendations to our um, healthcare leadership and that sort of feeds back into our clinics. So they're constantly improving our standard of practice. They have a consultation line. So if you want your healthcare system to you know, provide the best standard of care, they're going to tell you what the research says, and they're conducting research to constantly improve our understanding. They're fabulous researchers. They're the best in our field. Uh, and, and so from, from the very basics of reaching out to our community, getting people in our door easily, ensuring that people at high risk get higher, more intensive services, that our staff are trained better, and that we are also then researching our quality and it, uh, always feeding back in the system with best practices. It's really a complete system of suicide prevention care. Uh, in addition to that, I, I feel like I feel like I'm doing infomercial. Infomercial. It's like, but wait, there's more. Um, this is really fabulous. I wish civilians had this. This is by far what I think one of the best systems ways of doing this. We have free confidential crisis support 24-7, 365. And I was actually, just last week, I was in Canandaigua at this call center. So I got to personally shake the hands of the people who do this. They're an amazing group of people. The VA employs the largest uh, call center for suicide uh, crisis. And they have all paid staff who are trained. I think at least a quarter of them are veterans themselves. Many are family members of veterans. Um, they're amazing human beings. I've worked doing rescues with them. They're really good at their job. And so if you call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and you press one, you're going to get sent to our call center in Canandaigua. They're going to provide gold standard crisis intervention care. And then those, those folks will ask if you would like to get a referral to your local SPC. So they're going to see, they're going to take care of you in the moment. And then they're going to send me, a uh, little, little April Dr. Foreman, uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, is going to get a consult and let me know what happened in the middle of the night, what your crisis was, and what you need. And I'm going to then be able to tell your primary care doctor. Uh, you know, I've had people call, you know, people going into crisis because related to 
uh, substance abuse problems or related to suicidal thinking or related, you know, sometimes to things like their, their blood sugar being very off because of uh, diabetes not being regulated. I mean, just think through. Or if, you know, they've, they've lost their housing. And, and there's all sorts of services within VA that address a huge range of health care and needs. And so then I'm able to that morning, and we our team does this first thing every morning, we, we open the consults and we immediately work through all the calls that have been received overnight. And we make sure that there's a local follow-up for every consult. And we, we contact everybody with, within one business day, and usually by lunch, so that you get immediate connections, whether you're enrolled in care or not, from your local suicide prevention coordinator who has access to all of your local resources. And family members may call us, and I may call back, and maybe, maybe the veteran you're concerned about isn't enrolled in care. Or maybe they are, but they're not telling us what's going on. And, I, and I'm going to figure out what to do. Uh, we solve an amazing variety of problems every day. Uh, I'm going to tell you that I love working with suicide prevention coordinators. They are my favorite people. They are some of the best mental health providers you will ever meet. And they're very, very good at this kind of closed loop care that you start in crisis calling a call center and then you get, we close the loop and get you to a local face-to-face -face resource. And we do it every day. Uh, these folks are trained responders. Uh, hopefully, uh, you've seen the HBO special um, press one for, for veterans. It's wonderful about our veterans crisis line. The HBO went, uh, and that's where some of these pictures are from, and filmed how our veteran, res or, or excuse me, our crisis line responders do their job. If you want to see these people in action, uh, that HBO special, I think you can get it on Netflix. I think you can get it on Amazon. Amazon. It is a wonderful, I think, 30 minute or so documentary. Really help you see the work that they do. These folks are trained. This call center is excellently staffed. And it's staffed by people who are really familiar with the unique crisis needs of, of veterans. Hi, I just, I can't recommend it enough. They, they do amazing work and they do it every day. Uh, this veter Veterans Crisis Line amazingly has been open for nine years. Um, just a little bit of backstory, our Veterans Crisis Line was really developed uh, in consultation with uh, experts from SAMHSA and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline so that they came up with a really, really, you know, a really clear system for getting calls to one call center and one number so it would be not confusing to use. Uh, very, very thoughtful how they set this all up. Um, but these were stats, I think, from 2013, and so I think we're up to 3 million calls at this point. But we do calls. We do crisis intervention by chat. Uh, and, and for civilians, you might go to crisischat.org, but for veterans, you can go to veteranscrisisline.net. We also do text messaging, and they, I mean, I think we're at like half a million referrals, and then we, we get people back to their suicide prevention coordinators. And we sometimes, unfortunately, need to dispatch emergency services. But unlike in the civilian world, because we are one connected healthcare system, what we are able to do is if we, if we call for emergency services to get you to emergency care, suicide prevention coordinator is going to be alerted, and I'm going to be able to tell all of your regular doctors what, what happens overnight, what hospital you might be at, and make sure that your entire care is coordinated so that when you are out of crisis and come out patient, we're ready to see you and we're all up to speed. I, this is, uh, I, we do this every day. It is really a fabulous system and it works well. Uh, let me talk about suicide prevention coordinators. Uh, we have more than 300 SPCs nationwide. We're uh, the primary drivers of outreach and education locally. Like I said, each one of us is doing uh, 60 outreach contacts uh, a month. So just for our, just us alone, you've got to imagine uh, that's 18,000 outreaches a year that we're that we're providing as a group uh, or more and I'm going to tell you these folks are on the or more side um, they do a lot of what's called reporting and tracking so we're doing a lot of uh, population health work we uh, we populate a national database on suicide attempts and suicide deaths so that uh, unlike any other healthcare system which does not do that we really do pay attention to that and so that we can have um, it's called SPAN is the name of, of that, and what we do with this uh, Suicide Prevention Action Network is that we have data that is, you know, you can look at every day that lets us know um, the, the state of attempts and suicide deaths every day, and, that, and those numbers change, and we're allowed to look at those numbers and look at risk and respond to veteran suicide risk population health 
much more quickly with data uh, in comparison with, like, say, the CDC or, or um, regional regional healthcare networks, just simply because we're collecting that data. And we do a lot of that. Uh, I know that I report every single day to our healthcare system director any new attempts, any new deaths, and, and let them know what we're doing for follow-up. Um, we also do monitoring and oversight. I mentioned before, I ensure that every veteran identified at being high risk for suicide gets enhanced care and that and just and I, it's just an extra pair of eyes to absolutely ensure that they're getting the extra red carpet treatment. Um, they're VIPs in our healthcare system and, and, and we because we believe they may be at risk of dying, we we are much more focused on their on their management of their care. Uh, we also provide oversight, uh, so we regularly report feedback to our local healthcare systems to let them know what our special needs are, what new best practices are, how we can improve what we do. And of course, many of us provide direct care. We provide uh, phone calls, uh, sometimes we provide assessment and walk-ins. I personally provide a DVT group for veterans identified as chronically at high risk for suicide who are not getting better in other mo treatment modalities, so I take on I have special training to take on the very, very serious cases that have not been getting better. Uh, it's been, been on our high risk list for a long time and not been responsive to other treatments. And, uh, and, I, and I specialize in that care. And many of our suicide prevention coordinators are specially trained. Like I said, I, I just, and, 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 I, and, I, and I just, I say this with all my love. I'm sure everyone, there are many, many great mental health providers out there. I just, I, I may be biased, but I think the SPCs are just the best. They're amazing. Um, we definitely do outreach. You'll see Caitlin Thompson's picture under speaking engagement. She, uh, is, she speaks all over the world. She's amazing uh, force for suicide prevention and education. Uh, we reach out with um, we reach out with social media. We provide. You'll see tables at conferences. Uh, so if you call your local SPC, they will. You know, I go out all the time to local conferences, and I bring suicide prevention swag and expertise. Uh, I may be asked to meet with veterans who are there at the event, I've done that. We reach out to veteran service organizations. We reach out to corporations and large-scale agencies that employ veterans. So, for example, uh, I was asked to provide suicide prevention training for the Social Security uh, Administration locally because they employ a lot of veterans. Um, we, we work with, I, you know, I will often go out to local military units. Uh, I will work with you know I work with the local National Guard all the time to provide training, consultation, and all kinds of support. We also work with faith-based faith organizations, so I've been regularly invited uh, to regional um, faith-based conferences to provide expertise and support. Uh, we go wherever wherever we are wanted uh, as experts and as support. Um, we have a really cool training that we do. It's very really similar. Some of you may have heard of Safe Talk. It's very similar to that. It's called Operation Save. Um, we will we provide training in helping uh, work with veterans at risk of suicide. So you're gonna we look we teach people how to look at the signs of suicidal thinking, how to ask about suicide, how to be validating when veterans uh, report that they're suicidal and how to encourage people to get treatment and how to get to treatment quickly. And, and you know, includes a lot of the information that I'm sharing with you today. Um, we know that people, veterans in crisis, often uh, show warning signs. And, and I know I'm talking to, I'm sure, a very educated group about what the warning signs of suicide risk are. So hopelessness, anxiety and agitation, feeling like there's no reason to live, feeling like they can't escape pain, irritability, uh, risky activities, increased substance use, cannot stress that enough. In many of our deaths, there's a real escalation of substance use related to their uh, suicide deaths and withdrawal from family and friends. Um, and so anytime, we also tell people that anytime someone says they're thinking about hurting or killing themselves, looking for ways to kill themselves, talking about death, dying, or suicide, or really escalating drug use, or substance abuse, really escalating, uh, acquiring weapons when we know they're very unstable, things like that. We get we educate community members to get our immediate attention and get them help and support. These are things that you would know to do, I think, for anyone at risk of suicide, and we specifically let people know what resources are there for veterans. Uh, we have an excellent, and, and we're getting to wrap up in question time, but we have an excellent gun safety video. Um, if you go to YouTube right now to, for the, um, 
for the Veterans Health Administration. If you go to our um, if you go to our YouTube channel, first of all, you're going to see the Preventing Veteran Suicide Call to Action videos, which are fabulous. There is also a public service announcement, no one can unfire a firearm. If you've not seen that, go to YouTube and watch that. It is one of the, Wrangle Media did it, it's fabulous. It is one of the best uh, public service announcements on managing uh, firearm safety related to your uh, mental health risk. And, uh, it's very, very sensitive because, once again, veterans uh, are very much, a, you know, gun-owning culture, and we respect that, but we really do need to talk about safety. We also distribute thousands, hundreds of thousands of gun locks. I distribute my fair share because we know that guns that are stored safely with ammunition stored in a separate place that are kept locked and are, are much more likely to reduce people's risk of death. It's much like wearing a seatbelt in your car. There are public health things we can do, like securing firearms that we know will reduce um, accidental death and death by suicide for veterans and their families. We raise community awareness through public service advertising. These are all on um, the Veteran Health Administration's YouTube channel and also on Make the Connection. These are really fabulously produced public service announcements. You really go check them out, share them on your Facebook pages, they're great. We have a variety of campaign materials. Uh, I give these out all the time. Pillboxes, as you see right there, are one of the favorite things. Uh, and I totally encourage people to quote steal as much as they want off my table. Bracelets are popular. The, the keychains are popular. It's bags, kickstand pads, stickers, all sorts of great stuff that you can, uh, that you can request your suicide prevention coordinator send to you. Um, we also have a wonderful um, hub with a social media toolkit. And so if you go to VeteransCrisisLine.net, you can access a lot of our resources there as well. Uh, please do. They're really quality resources. They're well produced. Um, and, 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 and I've seen a lot. Really, I think Veterans Crisis Line does it just about as well or better than anyone. Um, VeteransCrisisLine.net also has a resource locator. So you can put in your, your zip code, and they're going to show you how to, how to find your local suicide prevention coordinator local community crisis centers, and where your VA medical centers are going to be. So if you want to help a veteran in crisis and you want to know either how to call me, how to get to the local crisis line, or how to get to my to, to the local VA healthcare center, you're going to be able to find that out by zip code. It's fabulous. Please do share that. Uh, we want people to find how to get to resources. Uh, we have Make the Connection. This is also fabulously well produced. Uh, I was at SAMHSA for on a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Steering Committee meeting, and we showed this. We really wish civilians had something like this. Uh, Make the Connection produces a great deal of social media, videos, shareable content that can be selected based on the demographics and the particular issues of the veteran you're helping. So you can say I'm a male veteran who's 31 years old struggling with insomnia. And then you're going to click and find a bunch of resources tailor-made for you that are that are produced with a great deal of quality. Uh, this, it's just really fabulous. I share these on my Facebook all the time. People like and share things that I share. These are often well, uh, very shareable and well-received media. Uh, 380 plus, and they're well over that at this point, video testimonies, plain language veteran, real veterans, films telling their real stories, they aren't actors, and how to find local services. Make the connections fabulous for helping veterans, great. Um, we also have information for understanding veterans, and so we have information about a variety of issues we're looking at this, and including, I believe, bipolar disorder, uh, if you go and look there, but really helping helping understand not just being suicidal but other mental health issues that are important that veterans can help understand themselves better and that all also might be shared with family, friends, community. And just very quickly as I'm finishing up, we have resources in a lot of places. You can go to mentalhealth.va.gov. We have vet centers which particularly provide counseling resources that are more confidential. I mean they don't even share their notes with VA. Uh, for combat veterans, and you can go to vetcenter.va.gov. Uh, that MyRIC that I mentioned, those fancy research centers, uh, have a coaching center. You can There's a, an 888, a toll-free number, 888-823-7458, and you can call and get someone to help you coach the veteran that you love and to care. So you can get expert consultation from our literally the best um, experts in suicide prevention and care. We have community provider toolkits at mentalhealth.va.gov. 
You can see the links for that on the slides, which hopefully you're looking at. We have resources about PTSD. We have PTSD Center for Excellence. Uh, we also work with the Wounded Warrior Project and with uh, NAMI, who many of you know, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And we regularly refer to these resources. I work with my local NAMI and my state NAMI all the time. They're fabulous. Um, and of course, you can always go to crisisline.net. There is Caitlin Thompson's uh, VA contact information. You can also find me at april.forman, F-O-R-E-M-A-N, at va.gov. And of course, you can contact me. My, I'm going to give you my actual desk phone number anytime at 225-768-6406. Uh, Caitlin does respond to emails and calls, or she, or she has someone like me, one of her detailees, respond. So we really do take our community engagement seriously. Please do feel free to contact us. Uh, I, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'd love to take questions. Excellent. Thank you, April, for sharing with us um, very important information, critical, and so wonderful to know that um, all of these resources are out there. Um, let's see. We do have um, one question to start, and this is, um, is the 22 per day um, relative to um, suicide, death by suicide, the best number we have without an estimate of what the real number is? Or does it include those deaths that we can't be sure of um, in terms of suicide, if they are suicide or not? That is a really great question. That's a question that I get a lot, and I'm so glad that you asked. So a couple of couple things. Uh, knowing for veterans or for anybody, so in the United States or even globally, how what our real quote quote unquote real suicide rates are is is a really really hard thing to research. Uh, CBC has difficulty with this. VA probably does a better job, and that's why you hear about 22 veterans a day. Uh, I mean, we have similar um, estimates for the general population. 116 United States citizens die by suicide every day, we think, and that's that estimate. So, I mean, every day that we lose 22 veterans, we're also losing 94 other Americans, and, and we don't hear that, you know, the 94. Like, I really wish that we heard 116 every day. Uh, and there's my doorbell. Uh, but that 22 number is really, sincerely, the best estimate that we have. If you want to know more about how that number was derived, if you Google um, Jan Kemp, K-E-M-P, uh, suicide and the 2014 report, you're going to get uh, the full research paper. It's publicly available, easy to link to, that will tell you all of the work that went into getting that number 22 a day. And the range is maybe more like 18 to 22. Um, that number is really uh, based on numbers collected from 21 states, which are like the only uh, states that we can really even get data from. And, and that study goes into some real detail explaining how challenging it was to not only find states that collected or discounted, like I'm talking one, two, three, four, five on suicide rates. I mean, the truth is almost no one is counting any suicide, let alone everyone's suicides and then comparing them to veteran suicide. The VA is really the only organization that's really counting them on the scale. Uh, and so it's the best number that we have through Herculean efforts of, of getting data sharing across states. And you know, there are huge graphs that really show which states are sharing what data or what the status of their data collection is. I really encourage people to look at that. I think the take-home message isn't you know, are we missing veteran suicides? I'm sure that there are veterans who are dying by suicide that we're not aware of. I'm sure that there are Americans dying by suicide that we're not aware of. The real problem is that, that and from a general public health uh, perspective, and any suicidologist will tell you, they talk about this at Harvard and our public health a lot, we really need a national effort to count all suicides and to have better data. I mean, we count... We count uh, violent deaths. We have a violent death registry that, that is, that, and violent deaths, by the way, are what, they're much rarer than suicide. We really need to have a national effort to count suicides, period, and to also include in that a, an easier way to count veteran suicide. And, but, but so far, through great efforts, 22 is the best we have. I hope that there becomes the public will uh, in, in the United States to just count suicide better. Does that make sense? Yes, great explanation. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, are there VA crisis houses available that you know of? 
Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I suspect I know what they mean by crisis houses. Are they talking about like um, cool down centers, like crisis crisis diversion centers? Sure, probably in treatment facilities. Okay. So we definitely have a lot of places where people can go if they're in crisis, and that really, really varies. Um, the saying really goes, if you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA. Um, each, each VA sort of structures the kinds of services it has to meet the needs of the region it, that it's in. And so if I told you that, that there was a crisis house or crisis place to go, the, the, and that it, it probably wouldn't be uniform across VA. So, for example, I live in uh, the New Orleans area, and New Orleans lost its VA hospital in Katrina. And we're almost ready to open our new one, but, I mean, we lost a lot of infrastructure. So the best way to know what your local resource is is to contact your local suicide prevention coordinator through that um, veteranscrisisline.net resource uh, locator uh, and to find out what the resources are locally. Sometimes VA, I mean often, quite, I mean I know we do here, we often collaborate with various community resources uh, and we'll refer people to the nearest ER usually. Um, I know that some, where I worked in rural Kansas, we had a crisis diversion center and so instead of going to the ER you could go to um, sort of a cool down unit that was staffed by mental health professionals and peers. And depending on VA and depending on each community, different things are available. If you think those are important resources to have, I hope that you will advocate for both your community and for VA to have those, because I, I do know that, um, I do know that community advocacy and veteran advocacy works, and I do know that those cool down centers uh, can be a really effective way of reducing, um, you know, increasing the effectiveness of our crisis response. Great, thank you. How do you go about um, advocating for these programs or services in your community? What's the best way? Uh, that is a great question. And I, I of course, um, have been advocating for a better mental health system both prior to my work at VA and during VA. There, um, I always believe there's safety and effectiveness in numbers. So a lot of times I do a lot of my both um, both my advocacy for veterans, I do a lot in, in coordination with my local VA, uh, like you might call your suicide prevention coordinator and ask, you know, sort of what, what you're doing locally and how it's connected. I work with Manny locally a lot to advocate, not just for veterans, but for better mental health uh, infrastructure in my whole community. I want you to remember the 17 of the 22 veterans who die by suicide never reached VA doors. And so the better community infrastructure we have, the more likely it is that we're going to be reducing veteran suicide. And so we always, uh, I always support advocacy to improve the infrastructure, you know, access to, you know, crisis centers, uh, in community, access to community uh, mental health crisis services, uh, you know, mo you know, I know that my, for example, my local community is uh, going to be, is looking for funding and long-term sustainment of a mobile crisis unit so that people can, you know, a mobile crisis unit and go to people's homes when they're in crisis and then having a crisis diversion center and then having um, local um, mental health diversion inpatient beds that are specifically targeted on that. And NAMI and the local community mental health center where I live do the best advocacy, so I always participate in outreach with them related to that. Call your suicide prevention coordinator or call your local NAMI chapter. Those are excellent places to start. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, the next question, when veterans re return home from a tour of duty, are they vetted before they're released? Um, this is an interesting question, and, and I'm, I'm assuming that you're asking if they're screened for mental health problems? Sure, any type of issues. Yeah, so this is, this is something that uh, hopefully, if you go to our YouTube channel, um, the Veterans Health Administration's YouTube channel, and look at that call for action, um, that is a really, really great series of videos broken down by speakers, and I believe one of the speakers in that addresses this really well. When veterans are separated from the military, and they call that sort of separation, uh, and they're, they're, uh, they're discharged from the military, they are screened for mental health problems, um, and they are asked about this. And, and uh, unfortunately, the way this current system works is that uh, if you say that you're having any challenges, then that, that then you don't get to go home. Like then, whoa, they put the brakes on. 
because they're going to do more thorough screening evaluation of your health and getting you care. So if you're wanting to separate from the military and get home, get on with your life, get to your loved one, get a job, establish yourself in your new quote-unquote civilian life, uh, it is really highly incentivizing for you to not maybe disclose some of the mental health problems that you're having. Uh, the, the DOD is aware of this, the VA is aware of this, and they're working to improve this process so that they can like get more accurate information about what veterans' health care needs are, and to really encourage veterans, uh, while they're still active duty, to disclose what their mental health challenges are and get treatment. I know active duty military who disclose their mental health problems, they get treatment, they get well, they don't lose any of their momentum in their um, military career, and their, their lives are really enhanced and preserved, and, and we're really, they're really encouraging um, DOD, Department of Defense Leadership, to really speak out on this. But uh, for really good explanation of this, I really encourage you to go look at those YouTube videos on the Veterans Health Administration called Action Playlist. Great. That's excellent to hear. Um, it looks like that's the last question, April. I want to say thank you. Um, again, this is so wonderful. Um, it's going to be a great resource for International Bipolar Foundation, just reminding you all that it is. this uh, presentation has been recorded and will be archived on our website um, for you to share. Um, or if you think you missed something, to uh, refer back to. And um, I hope to see you at our next webinar. And everyone have a wonderful day. Have a great month, y'all. Thanks for listening.